Hello, and welcome to Valhalla, a podcast sponsored by Valhalla Exotics, your number one choice for exotic reptiles, education, and product needs for all of your reptile care. My name is Joe, and I will be your host. Today's podcast is a general care podcast on the basic items that you will need to care for exotic reptiles. So, tune in, and I'd be happy to explain what each of these things entail and how to best care for your reptiles. The first thing that you need to consider when you are looking at purchasing an exotic reptile is how big is that animal going to get and what size of enclosure are you going to need in order to care for that animal now as well as when it gets older and reaches full size. In the past, people would purchase a small snake and assume that it's not going to get very big or they would believe the fallacy that it's only going to grow to the insides of its conclosure. This is not true and some animals, especially reptiles, can grow quite large. Without proper education by the staff who are selling the animal, you could end up with an animal that may require an entire room or an entire house size cage. Sizing is important for your reptiles because you need to make sure that the animal has plenty of space to provide a temperature gradient. That means that you have to have a hot side that reaches a good basking temperature for that animal and a cold side that reaches a temperature that they can sustain and still digest without getting too cold and slowing down their metabolism or causing respiratory infections. I always like to take my snakes and measure them and make sure that they can stretch out along the length of their enclosure and that about half of them can stretch out in the other direction. So if I'm doing a snake that is four foot long, I want to make sure that I have about a four foot long enclosure that's about two foot wide. Now depending on whether or not this animal is arboreal or not will affect the height of the cage that you would need. So let's talk about different types of enclosures. The first enclosure type that I would recommend and that would be one of our VCC or Vanaheim cage conversion systems. The reason I would recommend those is because, well, I designed them and I think that they're great. I designed them specifically with reptiles in mind and they're designed to allow you to take any size of tote and turn it into an enclosure. These are your standard Sterilite or Rubbermaid tubs that you can convert over by adding the portal system, the venting, the lighting structure, you can add heating sources to them. They hold heat very well. They allow good ventilation with the venting on the sides rather than on the top of the cage. And you're able to keep the animal enclosed and do it for a relatively cheap price when considering that all of the products are reusable. You can take those same products and move them over to a larger enclosure as the animal gets bigger. And you don't have to worry about resetting an entire cage or not being able to use the same products you used in the smaller cage. The other types of caging that have traditionally been used are PVC and glass. Now, in the past, obviously I kept lots of things in old converted fish tanks or aquariums. This is not the most effective way to care for a reptile. The glass does not hold heat very well, and if you have any kind of draft or air blowing onto it, it can be really difficult to manage the humidity and the temperature of that enclosure especially when we're using a screen top. All of your humidity easily escapes out of the top of it. So using a PVC enclosure kind of solves those problems. However, PVC has become just about as expensive as glass when it comes to making an enclosure. And it can also be a difficult substance to work with. Making these cages and having a CNC machine can be quite expensive and buying them from somebody who makes it can also be expensive because that cost of that equipment has to be translated to the customer. Next, let's talk lighting. There are two types of lighting that you can use for reptiles, and that is UVA and UVB. UVA is what you feel, your heat source. That's what you can use to set up your basking spot if you are setting up a reptile that requires direct heat, either from above or from the belly. You can use a heat source such as an under tank heater, or you can use a bulb that provides enough wattage for it to translate that heat to the surface where the animal can bask. UVB is something else entirely. UVB is a type of radiation that reptiles actually use to synthesize their calcium. 
they can take in UVB either by ingesting rodents or supplementing their bug intake with calcium or you can take and provide them with calcium drops into their water. These things are going to be important because one of the care concerns for reptiles is that when they're inside using artificial lighting they don't absorb or synthesize quite enough calcium for them to not get metabolic bone disease. Now obviously this isn't as big of a concern for nocturnal reptiles or snakes in particular but things like bearded dragons, monitor lizards, chameleons are going to require that UVB source in order for them to not start having bullet legs. If you don't want them to have calcium deficiencies in their body, which can affect their neurological system, it's really important to supplement that calcium and then allow them to synthesize it into a usable form by providing that UVB radiation. These lights don't typically give off heat, although there are some combo bulbs on the market. They do tend to be a little bit more pricey, but it's important to provide that for any of the reptiles that are active during the day or things that are diurnal. Other types of heating sources that I use for things that don't necessarily require a UVB would be things like radiant heat emitters. These are plastic heat emitters that screw to the top of the enclosure and they provide heat that radiates downwards, providing a heat gradient on one side of the cage and as long as it's long enough, providing an area on the other side of the cage that is cooler. You can use red lights or white lights, anything that's going to provide enough heat but it's also important to check the temperature at the basking site and not just rely on wattage as each house or each environment that you keep the animal's cage in is going to affect the actual temperature that you're able to maintain with that light. I will make a note that regular filament light bulbs tend to run out and blow quite often. So getting a ceramic bulb will actually last a lot longer and save you some money in the long run. For other things that aren't going to be using heat, or if you have cages using our VCC system that are stacked on top of each other, you can use under tank heaters, which are a heat mat that tapes to the bottom, or a heat tape that would go on one side of the cage that does essentially the same job. It heats up, provides one spot that is warmer inside the enclosure, and then the other side would be cooler. It's very, very, very important that when using heat emitters, under tank heaters, heat tape, anything that's going to provide a heat source that you cannot readily control with a dimmer or something like that, then you need to have a thermostat. These cannot be plugged directly into the wall as they will run at full temperature and either melt your enclosure or melt themselves and cause them to fail and possibly injure or kill your animal. Using a rheostat, pi meters, or VE electronics thermostats, or any of the other Zoomed or Exoterra are completely acceptable. I prefer the pi meters that are found in our commercial grade thermostats that people can use for either maintaining their refrigerators temperatures or maintaining a certain temperature for food if you're working on a cook line. These are excellent, can keep a temperature within a degree of accuracy and the best part about it is that I designed my branches for the VCC system to actually accept the pi meter probe which sits directly into the branch underneath your heat source so that you can control and monitor the exact perch that is your hot spot if you will for your arboreal animals. Humidity is another specific concern that you want to watch out for when it comes to reptiles. Knowing where your reptile comes from and the type of environment that it lives in in the wild is key to understanding how much humidity they're going to require for them to maintain their health. It's going to be a very species specific thing. This can be controlled through your bedding, evaporation, ventilation. It's important because it's going to help your animals maintain their shedding maintain their hydration, and keep them from getting that dreaded respiratory infection we all worry about. The first thing to consider in conjunction with humidity is your airflow. Airflow can affect your humidity, which is why I mentioned it when I talked about using a screen top for your enclosures. If you have a screen top, a lot of your humidity is going to go right out of the top of the cage, and if you're keeping it inside like most people do, then your air conditioner is going to actively pull that humidity out of the air which is one of the ways that it helps cool off our houses. If you take and use a solid top and ventilate on the side, then you're not going to lose as much humidity, and you're also going to be better at maintaining airflow throughout your enclosure. 
What you're doing when you set up an enclosure is you're setting up a micro ecosystem. This is a way of saying that I'm trying to recreate the jungle or the desert or the rainforest treetops inside of a small enclosure. This is not an easy task to do, but it can be done once you understand how to do this and what types of ways are going to maintain temperature, humidity, and airflow. For instance, with my arboreal green tree pythons or emerald tree boas, I've set up cages that are using the standard tubs that you would use for storage from Home Depot. I added the VCC system to it, which has a portal on the front, venting along the sides, lights and a heat emitter across the top, and perches on the inside. My vents being on the side and lined up in a way that allows airflow to travel across from cage to cage and keeps my airflow high, but keeps my humidity from evaporating off too quickly or being pushed out of the cage. If I have my cages in a certain area, I've actually added computer fans to them to increase the airflow and if my cages are kept in areas that are not able to get a lot of airflow due to the natural positioning of my air vents in the house. With humidity in respect to those cages, I'm maintaining that humidity by having automatic sprayers and using puppy pads, which is absorbent and evaporates to keep humidity high in the cage. Let's move on to substrates. There are different types of substrates you can use, whether it is chunked, shaved, ground fibers. You can use paper, you can use wood. There's a lot of different options out there, but let's talk about the different types that you can use that I recommend. So the first choice of base, whether you get chunked, shaved, or ground fibers, let's move on to substrates. There are several types. You can either get chunked, which is chopped up pieces of wood, shaved, which obviously is shavings, or you can get ground fibers. Chunked wood is going to be best for larger species, things that are going to have a... Chunked substrates are going to be better for larger animals, while shavings might be better for some smaller species, and ground fibers are going to easily get stuck in the animal's mouth, get into the water dish. So if you're keeping a high humidity cage, it might be okay, but anything that's going to be a little drier is going to get really dusty in there and kind of cover the entire of the cage. I don't really use ground fibers that much, unless I'm using a certain spot in the cage to be a digging or nesting spot, or if I have live plants in the cage that are going to require moisture. The different kind of bases you can have for substrate are going to be coconut, wood, which would be aspen, oak, or cypress typically, or paper, things like puppy pads, paper towels, or wrapping paper. Now with coconut, I really like this substance substance and I like to use it in all the varied forms whether it be chunks, shaved or ground fibers. The reason for that is coconut tends to have a little bit of an antibacterial and antifungal properties to it. This is going to help keep down mold and things inside the cage and helps with some of the smell. Other types of wood like aspen, oak, and cypress they lend themselves more towards molding or they're not very absorbent thus making it more difficult to maintain your humidity, whereas coconut's quite absorbent, and it helps with humidity regulation within the enclosure. As far as paper goes, I use puppy pads for my arboreal stuff. I'm old school, and I like to utilize this because I can spray it down, and as it evaporates out of it, it will help maintain my humidity. But then when the animals urinate or defecate, it does help absorb some of that and make for easier cleanup. Paper towels does essentially the same job, but can get expensive, and they also are not as absorbent as I would like, and a lot of the times I end up using more paper towels just to clean up afterwards. Wrapping paper is good for species that aren't going to require a high amount of humidity. If you have a snake that likes to turn over the water dish, or an animal that requires high humidity, where there might be condensation, then this may not be a good option for you, because it's just going to get wet and stick to everything. Now, you have an enclosure, you have it set up, you have all of your parameters dialed in, and you have your animal home. Let's talk about feeding. So, the first thing you're going to want to do is probably hold your animal. Maybe hold off on that for a few minutes. And the reason for that is, a lot of reptiles take some time to adjust to their new enclosure, their new surroundings. It can be a stressful time for them moving, just as it would for you if you had moved to a new estate or a new country. So once you've got your animal home, give them time to relax, time to settle in, and then offer them some food. Once they're eating, 
then feel free to handle them if they're an animal that likes that kind of thing. But let's talk about how often you should feed your animal. For different animals, it's going to be different. There are some things that eat every day. There are some things that eat once a week. There are some things that eat every three weeks. Depending on the species in your research, make sure that you have an established food source, you're able to get the things that they like to eat typically, and that you're able to get it in a steady manner. This isn't something that's going to be difficult for you to acquire, as not all food items are available everywhere. For babies, they're going to eat the most often. If you're dealing with small baby lizards, they may need to eat several times a day. Baby snakes are going to be easier, eating once a week, and usually eating a very small food item. As they get older, this typically slows down. So with sub-adults, you may not need to feed them two or three times a day. You may only need to feed them once a day. And then as adults, you might need to feed them every other day or every couple days. This usually applies to lizards and things like that. As far as snakes, I usually start off my babies eating every seven days, move them to 10 to 14 days as sub-adults, and then switch them out to three weeks for larger animals that are eating larger prey items. This also is affected by the animal's activity level. If you have a diurnal animal that is moving around the cage all the time, for instance, my false water cobras, they're a diurnal species of snake from South America, and they are constantly moving around their cage and hunting, which is what makes them one of my favorite snakes. Rather than being a nocturnal species that sits in the corner and doesn't do a whole lot until the lights go off and honestly I'm already tired and ready to go to bed, these guys are constantly active and therefore constantly burning calories. Snakes like this may eat every three or four days and they don't eat as big a meals but they're constantly foraging for food so I feed them more often. This is a healthier way of maintaining their body weight and keeping them interested in hunting around their cage rather than getting lazy and just waiting for the next big meal to be tossed in. Finally, let's cover water. The important thing to do is always maintain fresh water for your animal. Ideally, this would be every day. You don't drink old water from yesterday unless it's been kept inside of something that is a thermos and has ice in it for 48 hours like I do. But, obviously, if you have a large collection, this can be difficult. The minimum I allow my animals to go without having a fresh change of water is every other day. But I do peek in every day and make sure that nobody has dumped their water, nobody has a bunch of things in it, they haven't shed or pooped inside of it, and I make sure that they have clean water. Every other day I go through and I change everyone's water, which is quite a task. I usually keep a five gallon bucket and I dump all the old water out, and I refill with fresh from a water gallon jug that I fill up. Bacterial growth is an easy thing to have happen inside of a small enclosure or micro ecosystem. So changing this water frequently is going to be really important. I also dechlorinate and put supplements into my water. I use Reptisafe, which just has a little bit of electrolytes and some vitamins and minerals inside of it just to help keep my animals in tip-top shape. I just add a little bit of this to the water. It pulls out the chlorine and also helps maintain those micronutrients inside of their bodies. And I provide that to them, like I said, every other day. So this is how you need to set up your animals and without getting into any specifics, I realize that this is very general. I plan on doing more specific species covered care guides along the way. I really hope you enjoyed this Valhalla Bound podcast sponsored by Valhalla Exotics. Here, there are monsters, and I love taking care of them. So until next time, my name is Joe, and I look forward to telling you more about the amazing animals that I work with in the near future. As always, make sure that you stay Valhalla bound.